Inline engines, probably one of the most developed engine forms in the world. I mean, think about it. We went from a Ford Model T's 2.9 litre inline 4, making 20 brake horsepower, to my car's engine, which is a 1.4 litre inline 4, making 84 brake horsepower. It's insane how much we can do with modern technology. So today, I will explain everything you need to know about inline engines. So, welcome everybody, my name is Iruhon Kargai and today I will be talking about inline engines, what their pros, cons are, how they work, and why you should consider when maybe doing an engine swap with them. For these sort of engine videos, I will be looking at engine forms under how they work, their balance and smoothness, and their pros and cons which will be kind of a summary. I will be covering inline 4 and inline 6 engines, as these are the ones that make up the majority of inline engines. There are inline 3, 5 and 8 engines, but they are not very common or they just don't make them as of today. So let's start off with inline engines in general. Inline engines, sometimes called straight engines, are the most common types of engines since the year 2000. Nearly half of all new vehicles sold had an inline engine underneath the hood. In this type of engine, the cylinders are arranged in a straight line above the crankshaft. Most inline engines sport four cylinders, but some engines include three, five, six or even eight cylinders. The straight cylinder configuration reduces the need for balancing components, reducing mechanical complexity of the engine. Inline car engines do suffer from relatively small amounts of unwanted vibration at typical engine speeds and the long stroke of their cylinders give these engines superior torque. Their mechanical simplicity makes them cheaper and easier to maintain. And for anyone who doesn't know what stroke of an engine is, it is the distance a piston can travel up and down. The bore would be the width of a piston head. However, the mechanical constraint of placing all the cylinders in a row makes these engines increasingly unwildly as the number of cylinders increases. They tend to be taller and longer than other engines of the same power. Additionally, they require stiff and heavy engine blocks to support the force of the cylinders. At higher engine speeds, this design can be imbalanced, generating unwanted vibration. So let's move on to inline 4 engines. So how they work? Well, for one, let's get a basic understanding of how inline 4 engines work. An inline 4 engine or straight 4 engine is a type of inline or straight internal combustion 4 cylinder engine with all 4 cylinders mounted in a straight line or a plane along the crankcase. The single bank of cylinders may be oriented in either a vertical or an inclined plane, which is quite rare to see in our modern world today, with all the pistons driving in common crankshaft. Their typical firing order is 1, 3, 4, 2, although that may very well change depending on the engine. So let's move on to their balance and smoothness. So the inline 4 engine is much smoother than one or two cylinder engines and this has resulted in it becoming the engine of choice for most economy cars for many years. Its prominent advantage is the lack of rocking vibration and the lack of need for heavy counterweights makes it easier to be sporty, which means that it can rev quickly up and down. However, it tends to show secondary imbalance at high RPM because two pistons always move together, making the imbalance twice as strong as other configurations without them. So let me explain. As far as primary balance, it is perfect. There are two pistons going up and two pistons going down. They act as counterweights towards each other, making them perfectly balanced. But secondary balancing is not very balanced. So why? While a cause can be a piston traveling further during the top half of its motion than during the bottom half of its motion, which results in non-sinusoidal vibrations called secondary vibrations. The difference in distance traveled is due to the rotation of the connecting rod. At 90 degrees after top dead center, which we will call the TDC for now, the crankshaft end of the conrod is exactly at the halfway point of its stroke. However, the angle of the conrod, i.e. the left-right movement when looking down the crankshaft, means that the piston end of the conrod must be lower than the halfway point. What that means is that even though the crankshaft only turned 90 degrees, 
the piston itself has actually traveled more than halfway towards to the bottom. 180 degree would be the fully bottom of the whole thing. And in order for the con rod to maintain a fixed length, which means that in order to make sure that the con rod turns equally, on one side of the crankshaft it actually goes further than the side. Which means that in order to make sure that the con rod turns equally, on one side of the crankshaft it actually goes further than the other side, even though it only travelled 90 degrees in rotation. The same also applies at 270 degrees after TDC, which is the opposite side of the 90 degree turn. Therefore, the piston then travels a greater distance from 90 degrees to 270 degrees after TDC than it does in the bottom half of the crankshaft rotation cycle. In order to travel this greater distance in the same amount of time, the piston end of the connecting rod must experience higher rate of acceleration during the top half of its movement than in the bottom half. Sadly, non-sinusoidal imbalance can almost never be completely cancelled or balanced with a single crankshaft multi cylinder configuration without balancer shafts. So let's move on to the last thing which are pros and cons. So let's look at the pros first. Well as I've said they are compact engines and can almost fit in any car because of how narrow and how very long they are. They are one of the most efficient engine forms, not just for fuel efficiency, but also for energy utilization of the fuel. The smaller an engine is, the more energy efficient it will be, and that goes for every form of engine really. They are quite torquey for something so small, and very nimble at that. Also the primary balance for them is exact and right in balance. They are simple, both mechanically and to work on them, and they are very cheap to make to buy or even to buy parts for them depending on what engine you have. And now some cons. Since these engines don't really go above the 2.5 litre mark, usually these cars are turbocharged or sometimes supercharged. When turbocharging an inline 4 it can be very laggy at times, especially when it comes to big turbos. Their secondary balance is off quite a bit at certain engine speeds because of how the crankshaft is set off with the con rods for the pistons to go up and down evenly. This isn't the biggest problem but it makes these engines so somewhat unbalanced. Four cylinder engines also have a smoothness problem in that the power strokes of the piston do not overlap. With four cylinders and four strokes to complete in the four stroke cycle, each piston completes its power stroke before the next piston starts a new power stroke, resulting in a pause between each power stroke and a pulsating delivery of power. In engines with more cylinders, the power strokes overlap, which gives them a smoother delivery of power and less torsional vibration than a 4 can achieve. So let's move on to inline 6 engines. It won't take as long as we already understand the basics of how an inline engine works. So let's start off with how they work. The straight 6 engine or inline 6 engine is an internal combustion engine with the cylinders mounted in a straight line along the crankcase with all the pistons driving a common crankshaft just like the inline 4. The bank of the cylinders may be oriented at an angle and where the bank is inclined away from the vertical the engine is sometimes called a slant 6. Their typical firing order is 1, 5, 3, 6, 2, 4. Although this may again change depending on the engine just like for the inline 4 obviously. So now let's move on to their balance and smoothness. An inline 6 engine is in practically perfect primary and secondary mechanical balance without the use of a balance shaft. The engine is in primary couple balance because of the front and rear trio of cylinders are mirroring images and the pistons move in pairs. That is piston 1 mirrors 6, piston 2 mirrors 5 and piston 3 mirrors 4 largely eliminating the polar rocking motion that would otherwise result. When I talk about mirroring I mean that as pairs the same way piston 1 and 4 and 2 and 3 moved in pairs for inline 4 engines. Secondary imbalance is largely avoided because the crankshaft has 6 crank throws arranged in 3 planes offset at 120 degrees. The result is that the bulk of the secondary forces that are caused by the pistons deviation from purely sinusoidal motion 
function sum to zero. An inline four cylinder or even a V6 engine with the crank speed balance shaft will experience significant secondary dynamic imbalance resulting in engine vibration. As a general rule, the forces arising from any dynamic imbalance increase as the square of the engine speed. For example, if the speed doubles, the vibration will increase by a factor of four. In contrast, inline six engines have no primary or significant secondary imbalances and with carefully designed crankshaft vibration dampers to absorb torsional vibration will run more smoothly at the same crankshaft speed or RPM. This characteristic has made the straight six popular in some European sport luxury cars where smooth high speed performance is very desirable. So let's move on to the last thing which are pros and cons. So some of the pros, well of course the first thing that has to be put here is how well balanced these engines are. They are unlike many other engines and are preferred by lots of people who race or car manufacturers who produce luxury cars. Another thing is that they are decently cheap to make unlike a V-styled engine. There is only one straight block with one head and one valve train. They are also, like the inline 4, very simple and easy to work on and therefore more reliable. And also, again, like the inline 4, these engines are also really torquey. And now some cons. These engines are extremely long. Even a V8 engine style is shorter as there are only four cylinders on each side, making them only four cylinders long. So it's not as compact as an inline four. However, it's still somewhat narrow. So there's plenty of space for, I don't know, accessories and yeah, well, get creative really. Since this engine style is so long, it is basically impossible to have an inline six FWD drivetrain car. Disclaimer. It is possible, but it's really hard to do and it's not very cost effective. These engines also have a high center of gravity. Now I did mention this for the inline four engines, but they are not that bad. But these engines, they are much taller and longer in size, meaning that you cannot mount them as low as an inline four or even a V6 or V8. These engines are also not as rigid, again, because of their long, narrow designs. Now, inline four engines, they are narrow, yes, but they are much shorter as well. And since they usually don't go above 2.5 liters, at which point the bore of those engines are usually relatively high, making them not so narrow at that point. But when it comes to inline six engines, they are much longer and taller than a normal inline four engine, making them less rigid. So that's it for today. I hope you all learned something new and if you did make sure to comment below and tell me something that I might have missed in this video. So if you like this video click the like button and make sure to consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell as I will be doing more of these videos. So thank you all for watching and I'll be sure to catch you at the next one. Models,